Podcast. Hi, I'm Ruud van der Pas. I'm a mathematician, work as a senior staff engineer in the Developer Tools organization at Sun Microsystems. I'd like to welcome you to a seven module training series brought to you by Sun. It's called an introduction to parallel programming. The trend toward multi-core and parallelization is creating demand for new skills from software developers. In this series, we'll discuss parallel programming as one of the fundamentals of application development. Last time, we discussed an overview of parallel programming models. Now, in module five, we will look at programming for distributed memory and the message passing interface called MPI. In this module, I would like to uh, focus on parallel programming models, in particular the, um, the MPI uh, model. In general, there are different ways of programming a parallel computer, and here I'm listing some of the more common ways of doing it. When we have a cluster or distributed memory architecture, we can always use sockets, which is a very low-level but standardized way of, uh, of programming. But it's very bare bones. It's, um, it's like assembly language coding, and not many do that. For a while, there was a, um, a model called PVM, Parallel Virtual Machine, that, that worked really well, but it had, it had its flaws and has been superseded by MPI, the Message Passing Interface. And today, that's the de facto standard to program a cluster of systems, especially in scientific computing. On the shared memory side, when we have a single system, a single address space, like a multi-core system or a bigger SMP system, um, we can always use a native threading model, like Java threads, POSIX threads, Solaris threads, Windows threads. Um, we can use OpenMP, which I will talk about in, um, in a future module. Uh, which is another de facto standard way of programming shared memory uh, systems. Or we can have the work done by the compiler, and that's called automatic parallelization. And it will, that will be covered in a future module as well. And I would like to zoom in on the MPI model. That's a distributed memory model. And what I'm showing here on this picture is a cluster of six nodes. That's the hardware. The nodes are connected through a network. It could be anything. Um, for MPI, that doesn't matter. I can run my MPI application on this kind of configuration, and it's up to the implementation to use the network in the right way. So I can start six different processes on this cluster. Each process has its own memory, and that's all it sees. So if the process makes a change to some data, it will be in its what is called local or private memory. Nobody else will see it. And as shown here, I would have six copies of the same program running on my cluster, and that's probably not a very meaningful thing to do. What a typical MPI program has is communication, where I exchange information. I exchange information, for example, shown on the slide here, process two may want to send some information to process zero, and maybe to four. And maybe likewise, process five would like to send something to three, and three wants to send something to one, five sends to four, and four and one exchange certain type of information. And it's all up to the implementation to handle this in the correct way. MPI is a logical model. To me, all that I see is six processes, zero, one through five, and I define my communication pattern. How that happens in the underlying hardware is again up to the implementation to handle. For example, node one and four may be not be directly connected, but that's not really for me to worry on about. The only thing is when we start looking at performance, then it makes sense to map the topology very closely to the hardware. But from a logical point of view, this program will work. So the MPI memory model is the distributed memory model. What I'm showing here is that I have a pool of processes. Each process has only has its local or private memory. That's all it sees. That's its world in a way. And there's a transfer mechanism to communicate information. And in case of MPI, as we'll, we will see in a few minutes, that's a typical send or receive call. And again, it's very important to keep in mind that all memory is local to the process. You will not see any data in another memory. You can only see it by exchanging it. The execution model is the following. All processes start at the same time, 
And then if I want to do my MPI communication, there's a mandatory call to the function called MPI underscore init. That's a mandatory call. After that point, I can start doing my MPI communications and I'll show you an example in a short while. For example, here, there's nearest neighbor communication. And again, whatever I want to communicate, I will communicate through the corresponding MPI function call. Here's another different, a different communication pattern. Again, it's my choice, I implement that. And the last one that I'm showing here is where all processes send some data to one single node. Usually that node is called the master node. When I'm finished with my communication, I call, have to call the MPI finalize. That terminates my MPI communication and it's typically the last statement in an MPI program. Because after that, I can no longer do any MPI-based communication. So that's the execution model. Here's a simple hello world level example. Little C program, and all it does, it prints out the message, hello sequential world. How do I turn that into a parallel program using MPI? First of all, I need to have an include file, which is shown in light blue. All MPI here is shown in light blue, so I have to have a mandatory include file. I introduce a variable me that I'm going to use in the remainder. I have my mandatory MPI init call, and I'm using a second MPI call to ask for an identifier. The identifier is returned in variable me. Me is a unique number that allows me to identify myself and also know who else there might be in my cluster of processes. Again, I would have to communicate that information, but it is accessible to me in a way. So each, each node will execute this main program. They will all get a unique identifier for me, and in this program they'll all do the printf statement. So all processes will print out the hello parallel world message, and they're going to tell me who they are. And then I have the finalize statement, which is the last one in my program in this case. If I compile this with the corresponding recipe how to compile and link an MPI program, I can run it. In my case, I'm using the OpenMPI implementation from, um, from the OpenMPI consortium. I'm using the MPI CC compiler driver script to compile my program and the MPI run command to run my program. I tell the system I want to use four MPI processes. Dash NP4 is, is achieving that. And what I see, I see the message repeated four times because I'm asking for four MPI processes and each will print out who they are. And here we see the unique identifier, two, one, zero, and three. So again, this is a very simple hello world level program in MPI. I could do something more sophisticated. For example, in this program, I would like to send n integers from one process to another. It's an example of communication. Here's the program that achieves it. This program will run on both nodes that I want to engage in my, uh, in my system. Both, I need to have my, my mandatory include file. Both processes will initialize variables u and him. In this case, to the same value, but it doesn't matter. Remember, this is private, private memory. This is distributed memory. So you and him are different variables in the two respective memories. I then have the mandatory MPI init call. And like before, I ask the process ID, return to the variable me. Then I put in the following logic. If I'm zero, I'm going to send. I'm going to send my n integers. And I do that through the MPI send call. And what I'm going to send is an array, in my case, called data buffer. It consists of n elements of data type MPI int. These are MPI integers. And I'm going to send that to him. Him is one. So what this says, when you're zero, you're going to send n integers to process one. As I can send multiple messages to the same receiver, the receiver has to be able to distinguish between those different messages. So I have to give it a label or a tag. That's the 1957 number that you see here. That's my way to differentiate different messages on the receiving side. My logic also says if I'm one, I receive. So if I'm one, I call the MPI receive call, and whatever I receive will go into an array called data buffer. Now keep in mind, this is distributed memory. Data buffer is different on one node versus the other. I gave it the same name, but it lives in a different memory. And I expect n MPI integers from u. 
Now u is zero. So what this says, when I'm one, I expect a message from zero. I expect a message with label 1957, and I have a matching send and receive. I have done my bookkeeping, everything matches, and this should work, and it does work. When I'm done, I call the MPI finalize because that's a mandatory call in my program. So that's how this program works. Process zero will send, one receives, and I leave the MPI environment. So at runtime, the following will happen. Both processes will initialize variable u and him to one and zero respectively. Again, distributed memory, there's no interference. Me will be zero in, in process zero, me will be one in process one, and zero will do the MPI send. It will send the n integers to the destination one with the label 1957. And if I do my homework right, then there's a matching receive on the other side, and that means that this communication channel will work. I will send n integers this way. So I'm done. That's by and large what an MPI program is about. Now MPI is a very complex, rich model. You get a lot of um, more functionality that I'm showing here, but this is message passing in its very elementary form. So what are some of the pros and cons of MPI? The advantages are flexibility. Once I have an MPI program, I can run it on any cluster of any size. It's straightforward. Once I have identified the parallelism, all I have to do is plug in the MPI calls. The system will handle a lot of details for me. MPI is widely available. There are many implementations out there. You can choose whatever you like. Very widely used. It's a very popular programming model. But also some disadvantages. First of all, you have to adapt your application to the message passing paradigm. So you have to think of your application in terms of message passing. And that could be a lot of work. It's also very basic. You have to handle a lot of details and therefore there's, um, there's a chance of making mistakes. This is why it could be harder to debug and you certainly uh, would appreciate using a professional debugger for this kind of application because you need to dig into the underlying message passing system if you run into a message passing related bug. Uh, an MPI program, as nothing is shared, tends to use more memory in particular. You cannot share any data structures. You have to send them from one to another. And that means you duplicate information. And that means you need more memory. Input output always re requires special care. You always have to think about that and, and make it part of your design goals. Essentially, there's a different way of thinking. The, diff the distributed memory model um, makes you think um, in a different way about how to approach the problem. You have to realize how, to, how do I divide the problem into pieces, assign it to the different nodes, how do I distribute the data over the nodes, and how do I communicate. And I'll show you a very simple example just to illustrate that. Here's a numerical integration example. I would like to approximate the, the, the surface under the, underneath this curve. And the formula is shown here. I have an approximation for the area. Again, that's an approximation of the, uh, the integral of that curve. And a very simple scheme says you take a point xi on the x-axis, you compute the function value there, you draw a box around it, and that's an approximation of the volume under that curve. And you add up all these little boxes, and that gives you the approximate solution. This one is very easy to, to parallelize. It's actually an example of an almost embarrassingly parallel application. Because I can assign, in, if I want to run this on two processes, I can give each half of that domain. And then what I do, I have a master process that tells each MPI process how many points we have. That's my variable n in my formula. Each MPI process then defines what to work on, the left half, the right half in my example, do the work, and that will give me a partial solution. I have two halves of my solution. Both will send their contribution to the master node. The master node will compute the final result, and we are done. Again, this is a very straightforward thing to do in MPI. I'm showing it because it does require some thinking, like how do I split up my domain in different pieces, and how do I handle communication? In other cases, it might be more complicated. Let's say I have a com computational domain and I would like to compute my solution on that. A very common numerical way of doing that is to discretize 
the continuous domain by putting kind of imaginary grid points over it. And I approximate the solution in any of these blue grid points. And then I get the solution there. Well, that's very easy to do, conceptually very easy to do in MPI. I can, in this case, I could slice this domain in four independent pieces. I'll assign each piece to a different MPI process. And now I can do this in parallel on four nodes. But I have to be careful. Because very often these algorithms need neighboring values to update their solution. Well, as I'm showing here, the light blue element needs the red elements to do an update of the solution. And some of those values are in a different node. For example, process 1 needs an element from process 0 and from process 3. I'll have to send that. Remember, nothing is shared. This is distributed memory. So I'll have to share, I'll have to send. I cannot share, I have to send that information from one to another. In other words, I have to think about my communication. And that's part of the design goal. Another problem I could run into is load balancing. If this uh, algorithm uses dynamic grid refinement to zoom in, have more grid points in case the solution varies very quickly over time, then one node could end up doing more work than another one. Thank you for watching. Please look at other, other modules in the series. For more information on how Sun can help you designing parallel applications, please check the URL on this slide or send an email to the email address listed on the slide. Thank you very much for watching. We welcome your feedback.